Apostles. You love to hate them. Well, at least if you're Guts, then you definitely hate them. But the Berserk universe is made up of hundreds of Apostles, so it begs the question, just how are these guys created? Well, when a mommy Apostle loves a daddy Apostle very much, sometimes a baby Apostle is created. No, no, in all seriousness, all you have to do is sacrifice your friends, family, or something you care about to the God Hand, and in turn, they'll grant you a form that gives you inconceivable power. I mean, or you could end up like this ugly fuck, so uh, clearly it's a mixed bag, but you know what guys, you have to roll the dice in life, you have to take chances. Yeah, so if you can't tell from Gary the Snail here, there are clearly some apostles that are weaker than others. So what I'm gonna be doing today is ranking each apostle, weakest to strongest. So just to clarify, there are a few fan-favorite Berserk characters that I'm not gonna be talking about. So those characters include Lord Schnoz the Almighty, creator of Heaven and Earth, the Rape Horse, the Sea God, and the God Hand. And the reason why I'm not talking about these characters is simply because they're not apostles. Even with this disclaimer, there are still going to be people in the comment section saying, Why isn't Lord Schnoz number one in the list? <laughs> <clears throat> so with that out of the way, I'd also like to address, because there are so many apostles in the Berserk universe, I'm not going to be able to talk about every single one of them. For the most part, I'm going to be trying to address apostles that we have some inkling of information about, and try to scale them to one another based off of that. Any gaps in knowledge that we have, I'm just going to try to reasonably fill it in as best as I can. And I'd like to say also that this is my opinion from reading the manga. But with all of these disclaimers out of the way, let's jump on into the tier list. Ranking Apostles, Weakest to Strongest. Alright, so up first we have the female Apostle, uh, who I don't even think has an actual name within the manga. Uh, she's first seen in the Black Swordsman arc, but I think they just call her the Unidentified Female Apostle. So, um, from this point on, I dub thee the Big Titty Monster until further notice. Um, so, honestly, she is not that strong. She did kill my boy Corcus, okay? But, um, her strengths are really that more of, like, you know, seduction, I guess. Um, where she's like, hey, oh, hey there, big strong boy, I'll give you the old Slurp Slop 9000, uh, and then kill you. Yeah, so, I don't know, I mean, like, Corcus got to pretty much motorboat them titties, and then he died, so... I guess she does have a couple kills under her belt, um... Guts clapped her cheeks within the first chapter of Berserk, though, so, uh... Honestly, I would probably put her in about the average to mid-tier for Apostle Strength. Honestly, she's probably more likely to give you Chlamydia than actually kill you, so yeah, I think this is an okay spot for the big titty monster. Okay, so now we're moving on to... This is Snake. Colonel, can you hear me? Okay, so the Snake Baron. All the real homies, you hate the Snake Baron. The guy was a sadist through and through, just torturing people, eating people, and lighting villages on fire. Um, even Guts seems to reference this in the Conviction arc when he's captured by Farnese. But my point being is, the Snake Baron is an asshole. Um, when Guts fought him in Black Swordsman, I don't think it took Guts everything that he had. It was a really difficult fight, don't get me wrong. Yeah, I mean, like, while it was a difficult fight, Guts was still able to pretty much one-shot him with his cannon. So, I'd probably put the Snake Baron in the healthcare tier, because let's be real, you're gonna need some if you fight this guy. So, moving on, now we have the Serpent Prince the Demon King, the Demon God, and most infamously known as the Dread Emperor, Ganishka. Ganishka was so powerful that Miura was able to use this character to single-handedly turn the Berserk world into the world of Dark Souls. It was that insane. Now, the hierarchy of Berserk works where you have weak humans, astral creatures, apostles, and then the God Hand members at the top. And this is obviously shown in instances when you have uh, a top-tier apostle like Zod losing to Griffith, a God Hand member. However, Ganeshka was one of the very few apostles who actually challenged the God Hand, and while he did lose, he forever changed the landscape of Berserk, both literally and figuratively. I mean, if you guys need any more convincing, Ganeshka became so powerful that he would go on to lose his fucking mind like Randy Quaid. But if we're gonna talk about Ganeshka's base form, it does have a couple weaknesses. I mean, Guts was still able to harm him on both a physical and astral plane. Also, side note, is this not one of the best fucking manga panels you've ever seen before? But I digress, and if we're gonna talk about the Shiva form, well, I'll just be honest right now, there is no other apostle on this tier list that's gonna come close to that. Additionally, this form also created pseudo-apostles as well, so that's just a flex on top of everything else. Now, even when Ganeshka is cut in half, the amount of power that was welling up inside of him is enough to span across the entire Berserk world and merge both the physical and astral planes together. Yeah, so as far as Apostles are concerned, guys, Ganeshka has no other spot than the Unlimited Power tier. It is definitely deserved. He is by far the strongest Apostle we're probably going to see today. Alright, so moving on, now we have... 
Alright, so we have the Slug Apostle, not to be mistaken with the Almighty Snail Apostle, okay? Don't get it twisted. So, the Slug Apostle, uh, we really don't know shit about this guy, and from what I would guess, I mean, he's gonna be pretty weak. Um, if anything, it just raises more questions about if Apostles get any say in what they look like. Um, because if so, can you imagine sacrificing your friends and family just to look like fucking Escargoon here? Like, that's ridiculous. I'm gonna put him in Weenie Hut Jr. tier. Absolutely, uh, weak. I don't think he can do anything. He'd probably get stomped by most people on this tier. Okay, so moving on, we have Wild. You guys, uh, ready to get wild, right? <laughs> get it? Because his name's Wild? Okay, I'll shut the fuck up. Wild is hedonism personified in Strength Incarnate. If we're gonna be talking about this chronologically, Wild is the first apostle that Guts officially beats, right? Even though Zod kills him, you know, Guts still won that fight. But it took Guts everything he had to beat Wild, and it was for good reason, because Wild was insanely strong. In his base form alone, Wild was able to block Guts' sword with nothing but his teeth, and when he transforms into his full Apostle form, he grows a couple stories tall and easily puts on a thousand pounds of muscle. In this new form, Wild becomes even more agile, he's able to move extremely fast, jump to new heights, and of course, bulldoze through almost anything in his pathway. And keep in mind that Wild is performing all of these feats, despite the fact that Guts had already cut off his dick and stabbed him a bunch of times. So, all in all, I mean, Wild's strength, he's not to be fucked with, he's a big boy. Um, but with this said, I would not put him in the Strong Apostle tier list, that might be a hot take for some of you guys. But the fact still stands that Guts beat this guy during the Golden Age arc, alright? So, uh, just imagine if Black Swordsman Guts was fighting Wild with a Rage Amp, the Cannon, and all of his other artillery. Uh, Wild would be fucked. Alright, and there are other Apostles on this tier list that hold up much better when compared to Wild. Um, and pretty much, you know, Wild underestimated Guts the majority of the fight too, so um, I'm not gonna really put him anywhere above uh, healthcare tier. Um, and looking at this too, oh, Snake Baron, you fucked up, man. You know what? I, I fucked up putting you here. The Snake Baron is about as average in mid of an Apostle as you can probably get, so uh, yeah, man, I'm, I'm gonna move you down here. <laughs> Okay, so now we have this unnamed Apostle here, and I only put him on the tier list because he killed my boy Judo, so I had to uh, talk about him a little bit, but this guy really used uh, kind of like a long-range attack, using his tentacles as a whip to pretty much slash and stab his opponents. Um, I would say, I mean, they took him down pretty easily. Casca was able to pretty much one-shot him with a uh, good stab wound. Um, Judo was able to use a couple throwing knives as well, but if that's all it takes to kill an Apostle, let's be real, you're going to be in the weaker end of things, so... Um, because all it took was really one good slash to bring it down, I am definitely going to put him in Weenie Hut Jr. territory. Um, so yeah, I think he's going to stay there. Alright, so now we are moving into the Roaming Apostle. Um, at least that's his alleged name. Um, since we don't have a real name for him, I'm just going to call him Harvey Weinstein, because, you know, I think the likeness is pretty uh, uncanny. Um, but with this said, I mean, Harvey here was pretty much able to track down Guts, um, so he had a good sense of smell, and also when Guts uh, slashed open Harvey Weinstein, he was actually able to control his innards and able to kind of, you know, use them as a weapon against Guts. Um, and, and he was even able to actually kind of like take uh, a little bit of cannon fire from Guts too. But ultimately, one slash from the Dragon Slayer killed Harvey Weinstein, so, uh, you know, Harvey is probably going to go above the female uh, big titty monster here and below the Snake Baron, so I'm, I'm gonna put him in about average would be a good spot. All right, so now we're moving on to the Frog Apostle. I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the friggin' frogs gay! Yeah, so the Frog Apostle. We don't know much about this character. Uh, in fact, I take it back, we know nothing about this character. <laughs> I think he appears in like one manga panel and then never shows up again. However, the uh, Frog Apostle stole my heart, guys, okay? So I had to put him in the tier list. But what we do know is that Real Life Ryan made a video stating that he could make the Frog Apostle croak. Get it? Croak? Like, die? Okay, I'll stop. But in all seriousness, unless the Frog Apostle has some crazy poison ability or something like that, I think he's gonna be losing to most other Apostles on this tier list, so I'm gonna have to put him squarely in Weenie Hut Jr. territory. So now we got Grunbeld, and Grunbeld is a monster, an absolute goliath of an apostle. He towers over characters like Zod, who is a beast in his own right, let's be real. So to start off, I'm just gonna say right away, Grunbeld is probably stronger than most of the apostles in this tier list. He has supernatural strength and speed, he's able to pretty much kill multiple Kushan soldiers with a single swing of his hammer, he has insane durability, which it's even stated in the Berserk Wiki that his skin is stronger than steel. Yeah, so as if all of that wasn't enough, Grunbeld also carries Thor's Hammer, he has a shield that doubles over as a cannon, and to top it all off, he can breathe fire. 
I would say Grunbeld's biggest flaw was uh, turning into a dragon and fighting against the guy who literally uses the weapon called the Dragon Slayer. Probably you could see where that fight was headed. Yeah, so overall guys, I think Grunbeld is really freaking strong, um, obviously. Uh, when you have an OP dragon transformation, you're probably going to be clapping the ass of most of the people on this tier list. Um, I would say Grunbeld would fare pretty well and then beat most of the apostles here, except for maybe one. And that one apostle is none other than Nosferatu Zod. Zod the Immortal, the pinnacle of strength. When you think of Apostles, uh, Zod is normally the first guy that pops into your mind. And it's for good reason, because Zod is an absolute badass, the Gigachad of all Apostles. I mean, you even have notable Apostles like Locust and Grunbeld, who are pretty much just giving Zod a handjob by telling him how strong he is. Even Grunbeld makes a comment about Zod's strength, stating that he can best a force a thousand strong. Essentially, every time Zod is mentioned, it's done so with the reverence and respect, talking about how his power is beyond this realm and like in another dimension. Yeah, so Zod has a variety of skills and an array of talents, one of which being his swordsmanship and tactics. He can pretty much handle any weapon that he finds on the battlefield, he can dual wield swords and axes with ease. Uh, Zod is also capable of shifting his battle strategy, I mean, he can adopt new fighting tactics on the fly, which is what he's done with Guts numerous times when they've encountered each other. And if Zod just so happens to get injured on the battlefield, he doesn't have to sweat a thing because his durability and healing is insane. If he happens to lose a limb, he can easily reattach it, and he can take arrow volleys as if they're nothing. And as if that wasn't enough already, Zod can even tank lightning strikes from powerful characters like Ganeshka, he's been able to uphold a rivalry with the Skull Knight for many centuries. Even more than that, he fought one of the God Hand members, being Femto, uh, Griffith. And while Zod did lose, I'm sure it was a good fight in its own. But to sum it up, uh, simply put, Zod's strength is far above your average Apostle. He's easily able to dispatch Apostles like Wild, uh, and while Wild was on Death's door, it's still a feat for Zod because he ends up killing him. Oh yeah, and before I forget, uh, of course Zod can fly. I mean, he's pretty much Griffith's personal uber at this point. So of course, this begs the question, just where does my boy Zod fall on the tier list? Well, obviously, he is definitely below Ganeshka, because uh, there's even a manga panel where pretty much Zod states that he's not really able to do anything against Ganeshka, and he has to have Guts. He even says to Guts, like, hey, you show me how you can hack that thundercloud to pieces. Um, so he's, he's below Ganeshka for those reasons where he's not on the same tier of power. Um, I would definitely say he's in the ultra ass-whooping category. I would say he is above Grunbeld, easily. And the reason why I think Zod is above Grunbeld is due to Zod's own personal code of conduct, where he states that he only wants to fight the strong opponents. And because of that relentless drive, I think it's made him one of the best and the strongest apostles ever. Um, I really like Grunbeld too, and I would love to see a fight between these two. But at the end of the day, due to his centuries of experience and uh, his personal drive, I think Zod has taken this fight every single time. However, I think they're still relative in the same tier of strength. I think uh, just Zod is a better fighter overall. Oh man, now we have good old Roxas, the uh, the edgelord apostle. I, I always pictured him as like an edgy fucking apostle for some reason. He's one of the very few Kushan apostles that we have on this tier list, aside from Ganeshka. And um, his powers, uh, getting into them, I mean, they are pretty terrifying. So Roxas, being a former member of the Baki Raka, possesses some pretty insane stealth skills. Uh, obviously, he was an assassin, so he's able to sneak up on many different characters, Rickert being one of them. So if you haven't noticed, uh, Roxas has this very cloth-like, almost amorphous, formless body here that enables him to take many different shapes, and it works in two parts. So one of the most obvious ways it works is giving him that extra little bit of stealth where he's able to slip into the darkness, essentially, and become unnoticed. And the second way his cloak works, actually, it works in tandem with his whole uh, amorphous body aesthetic, where Roxas is able to hide and conceal his actual weak points from his opponents. So essentially, just because Roxas is wearing a mask, that doesn't denote where his face is. In reality, he can conceal it anywhere he needs to on his body. So I would almost describe Roxas's body as like a paper bag floating around in the wind, except obviously he has extreme agility and speeds, which pretty much enable him to evade most attacks uh, like Salat and the Tapasa that tried to attack him. And when we finally see his full Apostle form, it's actually revealed that he has the ability to fly as well. So overall, I would say Roxas definitely belongs in the strong Apostle side of the tier list. Um, I think the only two people that were really able to hurt him was Rickert and Salat, and both of them are badasses in their own right. Um, just the fact that Roxas is not only able to conceal his own weaknesses, but the fact that he can also conceal weapons as well is pretty, uh, you know, underrated, honestly, in my opinion. And I think he would definitely, I don't think Wild would be able to do shit to him. Um, I think he would pretty much be able to take most of the Apostles below him on this tier list, so I think he is the first strong Apostle on this tier. 
Oh man, now we have good old Rosine. Um, Rosine is one of the few apostles on this list that I, I, I genuinely feel a little bit of kinship with. I feel bad for her and I really enjoyed her character. Lost Children arc is probably one of my favorite arcs aside from the Golden Age. Um, but this is going to be a very hot take. I think Rosine is stronger than Wild, not physically, but with utility. And I would even say she's stronger than Roxas, alright? Again, this is going to be a hot take here. Um, and I would say with comparing Apostles to one another is difficult, because most of the information it, you have to go off of is the Berserk Wiki, and of course, all of their fights with Guts. Guts has pretty much killed half of the tier list here. But Rosine is crazy scary, and her abilities speak for themselves. So to kick off with one of Rosine's abilities, I think we should talk about one of her most prominent, that being her speed. Rosine, as an apostle, is one of the fastest we've ever seen. She's easily able to reach supersonic speeds when she's in flight. So just to give some credence as to how fast Rosine is, Guts has even said before that he's unable to follow her movements. He literally said, I can't see it. So honestly, that's pretty insane because Guts has fought really strong people like Nosferatu Zod, and he's been more than capable of, you know, blocking blows from him. Yet when he's fighting Rosine, he's unable to see her. But it definitely has to be mentioned that Rosine's speed does have a drawback in the fact that it reduces her accuracy significantly, so it can leave her open to being attacked. So, Rosine has other abilities like Poison Dust coming from her wings, she also has Enhanced Proboscis with the Stinger on her head, and this, in combination with her speed, is insanely powerful. But last but not least, Rosine has one final OP ability, and that is her power to make pseudo-apostles. I mean, sure, they look like a bunch of discount Tinkerbell, but in reality, they're actually strong enough to rip a grown man's face off, so, you know, I wouldn't mess with them. In addition to these, Rosine has even stronger pseudo-apostles working under her that Guts describes as tough opponents. Of course, to make these pseudo-apostles, Rosine has had to kill a lot of adults and uh, a lot of children, so uh, yeah, yeah, you know what I said about kinship earlier? Um, I'm just gonna retract that statement. Rosine, you're, you're kind of fucked up. But yeah, with all of these, uh, you know, skills and abilities, I think Rosine definitely deserves her slot in the strong apostle side of the tier list. I can't see her going anywhere lower or higher than this. Alright, so now we get the Egg of the Perfect World, and this one, honestly, I have no idea where the hell he would go. Um, you might as well call this section Shane's Bullshit Postulations. Um, you know what, I might even make that a new segment on my channel, actually. So we know the Egg of the Perfect World is powerful because he was able to take the Demon Child and use it as a vessel to convert Griffith's astral form into a human one. In addition to this, he was also able to make some pseudo-apostles, but I think his best feat by far was him being able to evade the Skull Knight. I mean, he didn't get out of that altercation unscathed, but at the same time, obviously he has some agility because he was able to escape. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is, this is an interesting case here. You know, honestly guys, I kind of want to just play it safe and put him in the healthcare slot. I don't think he would, uh, you know, I don't feel really confident enough putting him in Strong Apostle. But at the same time, if you're able to avoid the Skull Knight, you, you have some credence in my book here. You know, the real thing with him is obviously he's powerful, but I don't think it really translates to attack potency. So I would put him in the healthcare. I think that's a safe bet. But, uh, you know, guys, feel free to yell at me and tell me otherwise. Alright, so now we have Borkov, and I hear you thinking, that's right, I hear your thoughts, um, you're thinking, who the fuck is Borkov? Well, Borkov is this guy. Uh, oh, you don't remember him? Okay, well how about now? That's right, you remember this guy. Yeah, so this is Borkov, the piece of shit who ate God's left arm at the Eclipse. Um, if it isn't obvious enough, I really don't like this guy. I actually can't wait till Guts meets him again so we can get cleaved in half. Oh man, but until that day, I'm just gonna have to keep on hating him from the sidelines. But I'll give Borkov the credit he deserves. I mean, he is a fairly strong apostle. He's easily able to tank, uh, getting stabbed multiple times by Guts at the Eclipse. In addition to this, we also saw Borkov fight against an ogre, a fight of which he easily won. And I mean, hey, that's nothing to really scoff at because ogres are pretty fucking strong, so that's good. Throughout the manga, we've also seen that Borkov is easily capable of plowing through multiple Kushan soldiers, as well as walls in his path. I mean, if I was a real power scaler, I'd probably say something like this, um, Because of Borkov's feat of breaking down a wall, he easily scales to building or building plus level. <laughs> Alright guys, uh, power scaling community, please don't hate me, it's obviously a joke. Um, but with this said, I really would say that Borkov is pretty strong overall. Yeah, so overall guys, I think honestly this is gonna be another hot take, but I think, uh, Borkov is above average. I think he's easily in the healthcare tier. Um, he's shown quite a lot of durability, uh, which is a lot more than I can say about, like, the Snake Baron, who pretty much got one-shotted by a cannon and, uh, a sword swipe, versus, you know, Borkov, who pretty much tanked multiple stab wounds from Guts, and, um, 
yeah, he's been in the uh, more recent arcs of Berserk, and he's still out there kicking ass. So I'm going to put him in the healthcare tier. I think he's easily above the average uh, strength of an Apostle. Um, I wouldn't say he's quite in the stronger uh, side of the Apostles, but I would say he's slightly above average in healthcare. All right, so now we have Goat Boy, um, or, or Goat Man. I think it's actually Great Goat. I mean, who, who the fuck really cares? So in regard to the Goat Apostle, I mean, there's not much to talk about here. The guy was pretty simple enough. He liked having orgies, and he also rocked a serpent dick, so, you know, respect to him. But uh, aside from rocking the Devil's Foreskin, I mean, what else does he really have going for him? So we only have one fight with him, but his uh, feats were fair enough, I suppose. He was able to speed blitz guts and, uh, you know, get off a couple attacks. So while the Goat Apostle was pretty fast, I mean, he's nowhere near uh, comparable to the speed of Rosine. Guts was still able to track his movements, um, and additionally, he is a pseudo-apostle, so you could argue, due to that, that he's weaker than most regular apostles. I should also mention that the Goat Apostle is very susceptible to weapons like explosives. Rickard's bomb messed him up pretty bad, and I think his durability is lacking when you compare it to other Apostles. But the real question, of course, is where would I put this guy on the tier list? Um, you know, I think he's pretty mid, honestly. I think he's pretty average. I would probably put him next to the Big Titty Monster. I think they could be a cute couple together. Um, but I think overall his strength is very much that of an average uh, pseudo-apostle, average apostle. Moving on, we have good old Father Mosgus, uh, one of the most feared people in the Holy See when he was a human, uh, but now as a uh, pseudo-apostle he's able to back that fear up tenfold. So as far as Mosgus' ranking is concerned, he is kind of tough to rank because he is a pseudo-apostle. So, I mean, you could follow the logic that technically because he's only a pseudo, then he should be therefore less than a regular apostle. Um, however, there is one line of dialogue from Guts that's pretty crucial to actually assessing his power. Guts even comments that Mosgus is as powerful as an apostle, and he states that if I'm not careful, he'll be tougher than one. So, due to that, I think that provides us some pretty good insight, and I would honestly say that Mosgus is slightly stronger than Rosine, um, sitting atop the strong apostle side of the tier list. I would say this ranking is pretty justified. When Mosgus goes into his Apostle form, he has like this armored type scales covering his entire body, which makes him pretty much impervious to most types of weaponry, uh, including the Dragon Slayer. He was able to tank a blow at close range. Um, however, Mosgus's armor, while it is strong, it was not entirely impervious because uh, it did have a small crack that Guts was able to pretty much take advantage of. And this is mainly due to the fact that Mosgus had an injury before he transformed into his uh, pseudo-apostle form, so Guts was able to exploit that weakness. I should also mention that Mosgus' body is pretty unique in the fact that his armor can actually double over as like feathers, and thus granting him flight with his wings. Um, and again, these feathers can also transform back into fists whenever he needs to, so his body is pretty malleable. And of course, to finish it all off, Mosgus is able to breathe fire through his god's breath attack, and if that wasn't enough, he also has inhuman amounts of strength. Yeah, so I think Mosgus' ranking in the Strong Apostles side of things is pretty justified. I mean, you could definitely argue that Rosine is stronger than him, just because of the fact that Mosgus is a pseudo-apostle. Um, however, I honestly still think that he would probably edge it out if the two were to fight. You know, I think this is where he's gonna sit, and if you Mosgus fanboys aren't cool with this, you can fucking cry about it in the comments section, I could not give a shit. Um, <laughs> but with this said, uh, let's move on to Irvine. So Irvine is one of my new favorite members of the Discount Band of the Hawk, the uh, Band of the Hawk 2.0. He specializes in long distance fighting, so mainly archery. So Irvine is a very experienced archer, and we know that in his past life, when Irvine was a human, he specialized in hunting, so he's gained a lot of experience over the years. And this experience has enabled Irvine to be able to fire numerous arrows at once and hit all of his targets simultaneously. It's pretty insane, and I don't think he's missed a single time in the manga. And I should also specify that the force behind these arrows is not that of a regular arrow being fired by a human, it's far greater than that. I mean, it's literally able to decapitate somebody. So when Irvine is in his full apostle form, he's actually able to fire organic arrows out of the hair from his body. So these organic arrows actually have pretty interesting properties in the fact of when they hit their target, they're actually able to grow more hair from within the wound. Um, that could be a pretty OP ability depending on how you see but, it. But aside from Irvine's marksmanship, he's also shown to be extremely fast. So that leaves us with the question of where the hell do we put him in here? Um, and I could, I could picture a lot of you guys trying to justify putting him in the strong apostle side of the tier list. Um, however, I can't really picture him going head-to-head -head with characters like Rosine, Roxas, probably not. Um, honestly, I kind of picture him as more of like a prime, like top of healthcare. Um, I think he could easily beat Wild, um, maybe not Borkov. Again, I feel like a lot of these are situational. I mean, I, I only say like maybe not Borkov just because of durability. 
um, maybe his arrows wouldn't do shit to him. But again, you guys will just have to scream at me in the comments. Let me know what you think. Um, argue for healthcare or a strong apostle for Irvine. I'm going to put him at the top of healthcare now, but I could picture it going either way. All right, up next, it looks like we have the snail apostle... Huh, that was weird. Feels like my soul got sucked out of my body. Uh, anyway, the Snail Apostle. He could be strong, he could be extremely weak. Uh, you know what's undeniable is, look at them fucking calves, baby. This guy has tree trunk legs, okay? He did not skip leg day. I think uh, in his past life, the Snail Apostle must have been a bodybuilder at a minimum, and he probably sacrificed all of his loved ones to uh, get a little bit more swole, honestly. So, I mean, come on, guys. With a physique like this, uh, we can't deny the Snail Apostle's strength, alright? We have to give him uh, at least peak strong apostle because he is a prime specimen. Okay, so now we have Locus, the Moonlight Knight. Uh, we learned from Mule originally that Locus was undefeated in combat, and during his past life, he was a lancer. Throughout the manga, Locus has been shown to be pretty strong. He's easily capable of crushing concrete with his bare hands, even in his human form. And when he transforms into his full apostle form, you can just amplify his strength and speed even further. He was even capable of uh, skewering like 10 Daka all at once, so a pretty insane feat. Also, when Locus is in his full apostle form, the Berserk Wiki states that he gains the speed and agility of a horse for himself. Um, so what the, what the fuck does that- does that mean he transforms into a horse? Uh, you know what guys, it's Berserk, I'm not gonna think too hard about it. But due to his lancemanship, leadership, and agility, I think Locus is easily deserving of a spot in the Strong Apostle side of the tier list. Um, I don't know if I would quite put him above Moskis, um, but again, I, I think that's just more of my opinion. You guys can obviously argue about that in the comment section. I think Moskis has him beat as far as utility is concerned. Um, but I don't know how he would fare against, like, you know, fighting somebody like Rosine or even Roxas. I mean, all of their uh, abilities are so unique that um, it makes it tough to determine. So I think they're all easily scalable somewhat, like, in the same tier of power. Um, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Alright, so finally, guys, last but not least, we finally have the Cuck. <coughs> um, the Count, excuse me, the Count. Um, the Count is pretty strong. So, as far as the Count's strength is concerned, I mean, he is a massive apostle, so due to his uh, sheer size and strength, I mean, he's easily able to take down uh, brick walls and pillars, um, and he was easily able to, like, smash Guts around, like, as if he was a ragdoll. I think Guts would have lost that fight, too, if, uh, Teresia hadn't, uh, been conveniently placed there. In addition to his, uh, sheer size and strength, the Count also has durability and regeneration. He's easily able to reattach his head after it's been severed. And he even states to Guts that, you know, every time he loses a limb or it's chopped off, he grows a new one. So, for me, guys, uh, I would say regeneration is pretty overpowered. And as if the Count wasn't powerful enough already, he can also create pseudo-apostles, and he's shown doing this through Zondark, who is pretty powerful, um, as an opponent for Guts. So, overall, I think he is strong, uh, definitely not to be messed with. So, where does the Count end up? Honestly, I would probably put his fat ass in Strong Apostle. Um, I think the Count is easily stronger than most of the people in healthcare, with the exception of Wild. Um, the reason why the Count is up here, though, is obviously because he's able to regenerate and his durability is just a little bit better. Um, so I would say that, you know, most of the people in Strong Apostle probably outspeed him, but he makes up for it due to his, you know, sheer size, strength, physical durability, and regeneration. So I think that's a pretty solid spot for him. But there you have it, guys. The official Apostle Power Scaling tier list. Uh, tell me how bad my anime logic is in the comment section below, and be sure to uh, scream at me for all sorts of reasons. No, but in all seriousness, guys, I hope you did enjoy the video. It was definitely fun to make, um, and it was awesome going back through Berserk's early serialization and looking at all of the Apostles that we love to hate. There are so many different Apostles within this universe, and how their abilities would clash if they were to fight each other is truly up to anyone's interpretation. So you'll definitely have to let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. But if you liked the video, I hope you can like and subscribe, and I will see you next time with a new video. But until then, take care.